off this series, Why Worry? And today we're going to take what we started last week and build on that a little bit more. This morning, I want to talk about how we can learn to experience God's contentment in our lives, even though we live in a world that is filled with discontent. The series that we've been in uh, beginning last week is called Why Worry? We've been talking about why worry. And, you know, a lot of the things that we worry about are related to that discontentment that we feel in our own lives. God wants us to experience his peace, his joy, and his love, and we cannot do so as long as we have that that disconnection, that discontentment with him. Now, when Paul said, I have learned to be content in all things, you would expect that he was probably sitting on the beach looking out on the waves and the water saying, man, I've learned to be content in all situations. But in reality, he was writing the Philippian letter from a dungeon, from a prison. And it was there chained to a Roman guard that the apostle began to teach about contentment, not exactly the place that that we would expect to to find a teaching about contentment, contentment, but but in reality, we're going to see how God is going to weave that together and to use this in this letter to to communicate a great truth to us. Very few people experience contentment. In fact, the, the, the word contentment in the language of the New Testament means contained. So a person that is content has a contained life. A person that, that is discontent has uncontained desires. Desires all over the place. Discontent uncontained and we live in a world that is discontent people are always wanting more people want it different people are not satisfied many of us today in this room are struggling with feeling content with where we are in life so I want to give you a few questions this morning I've got a little discontent or a contentment questionnaire let me ask you a couple of questions number one uh, are you sad when others succeed more than you do Are you sad when others succeed more than you do? you discontent. Are you frustrated when the neighbor's kids have nicer stuff than your kids do? Are you discontent? Do you hate or judge people that you don't even know? You know, sometimes we can just look at somebody by what they have on or the car they stepped out of or the people that they're with, and we can think, uh, we can can judge that person, we we can despise that person, we can, can make preconceived judgments against that person. We don't even know them. And it all stems from that discontentment. You know, discontentment and envy go together. They're really, really good friends. A person who is content with where they are in life and what's going on in their own situation is the person that will not be envious. But the person that is discontent was the person that will envy what others have and we struggle with this. And still others of us may be struggling with the nothing is good enough syndrome, you know? Church isn't good enough. Work isn't good enough. The service at the restaurant wasn't good enough. My family's not good enough. My life is not good enough. If I could just change this one thing, then life would be so much better. But, but many times we can look around and nothing really is good enough. Well, if you're struggling with one or more of those things today, man, you have come to a great place because the Apostle Paul is going to challenge us and and call us to a decision today that I I really believe is going to be life-changing and powerful. And the reason that this message is so important is because so many people are making poor choices because they're discontent. And if we could learn to experience the the contentment that God wants us to have, we would make a lot better choices about our future and our lives. Discontentment could be defined as this. It's a feeling of sadness, frustration, irritation, and disappointment in your current situation in life. I'll say it again. It's a feeling of sadness, frustration, irritation, and disappointment with your current situation in life. And Paul uh, went on in Philippians 4.10, and he said this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you have had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every every situation, whether well-fed 
or whether I'm hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Sheryl Crow wrote a song a few years ago called Soak Up the Sun. She has a great line in that song. It says this, it's not having what you want, it's wanting what you've got. That's what contentment is. It's wanting what you've got. How do we begin to discover the secrets of contentment? Because, listen, when we begin to experience this this contented life described here by the apostle, we will worry and stress so much less, which is the goal of this whole series. Let's notice the first thing here. If we're going to overcome discontentment, And we're going to learn the secrets, the secrets of contentment. Number one is this, I have to learn contentment. It is not something that just happens automatically. Uh, It would be great if we could just show up at church one Sunday and check that box and then wham, you know, we just feel great about everything going on in our life. It's something that requires some spiritual growth. I have to learn to be content. I have to learn that. And it takes a little time. In Philippians 4.11, the scripture says, For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And Paul went away to the Arabian desert for three years before he began his ministry. In Acts chapter 9, Paul has that Damascus road experience. God uh, does something powerful there, blinds him there on that Damascus road. He becomes a follower of Jesus. His name is changed from Saul of Tarsus to Paul. And, and, and now Paul goes away for three years to the Arabian Desert. That sounds like the most boring place on the planet to be for three long years, but it is obvious that God was doing something in the heart of the apostle to get him ready for this great ministry that he was about to have. And he had to learn to be content. And we have to learn to be content. And, uh, you know, coveting is really another great example of discontent. Coveting is when we want something that somebody else has, right? You have something better than me. I want what you've got. I want your job. I want your wife. I want your life. I want your network. I want your connections. I want your resources, whatever it may be. And, and, and sometimes we struggle with that. It's actually one of the Ten Commandments is that we're not to covet. But listen, when we feel content with where we are in life, we don't feel the need to to desire to have the things that everybody else has. In fact, we can celebrate when people have a victory and when people have blessings that come from God instead of feel, feeling threatened by them. And the reality is that God blesses people in all different ways. And the sooner that we learn that, the more content that we will be with where we are in life. You know, a number of years ago, I was a college student. And I was traveling on my very first mission trip. And I was going to Siberia. Siberia, yes, Siberia, like Russia, Siberia. I'm talking like bears, you know, exotic animals. Siberia is not a place you just kind of happen to pass by, you know. We had three layovers just to get to Siberia. I mean, this is in the middle of nowhere. And the very first flight that we took was a direct flight to Frankfurt, there into Germany. We were on Lufthansa, the the German airline. And the, the man that I was traveling with, had done a lot of missionary work in the former Soviet Union, and so he had like massive, massive miles. I mean, he was like the best friend of Lufthansa type guy, you know. He walked up to the the, uh, person at the desk at the airport and asked for an upgrade, and boom, we were in first class. So now I'm flying like 12, 15 hours, something like that, straight over to Frankfurt, Germany in first class. They brought us a beautiful leather shaving kit with a Lufthansa emblem on the side. Fresh socks, deodorant, toothbrush, razor, uh, shaving cream, toothpaste, all that kind of stuff in the little shaving kit. First class passengers enjoyed the the, the massive leather seats. It was so big I could almost turn sideways, you know, and lay down. I mean, a big seat. It was nice. Fantastic world-class service. They were feeding me wild salmon and filet mignon for meals. I mean, it was, it was awesome. Uh, all the chocolate sundaes, you could imagine. I think I had three on that first leg of the journey, you know. And it was so cool because you have these people speaking to you in that 
really cool like German accent, you know, and you really feel like you've gone somewhere, you know. I mean, it was nice. And this was back years ago before they had all the TV monitors on all the seats and and so only the first class passengers had their own TV monitor. Everybody in coach had one big screen that they had to watch the movie on. There was one movie, you know. And I've got all these channels and I am living large. Before meals, they're bringing the hot towels out. I mean, unbelievable service. I had a great experience. I did not want to get off the airline, uh, air, airplane there in Frankfurt. And I thought, man, if this is what missionary work is, I love missions. This is awesome. <laughs> Whoa. So we go to Siberia. Two weeks later, we're headed back. And I told my friend, I said, listen, you know, I didn't mind flying from, from Moscow to Frankfurt and coach. But listen, you have got to upgrade. You have got to get us into first class to go back to, to the U.S. from Frankfurt because it is a long journey. And he said, well, I'll do the best that I can. He went up to the desk. The, the, the people there that were checking us in said, no way. We don't have any seats. You cannot be bumped up to first class. You have to ride in coach. Oh, my goodness. I was so disappointed. Now I've got to ride in coach class. Instead of wild salmon and filet mignon, you know what I'm eating? Turkey sandwiches. <laughs> Turkey sandwiches. There's one boring movie that's right there, you know, on the screen. No personalized TV. There's a big, huge guy that's breathing on me, falling asleep in the tiny little seats, you know. There's no shaving kits. There's no hot towels that are, that are being brought out for me to wash my hands. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, this is the worst ever. I couldn't wait to get off the airplane when we arrived back in the U.S. Now, had I not flown first class, I would have never known what I was missing out on. Coach would have been just fine. But there was something about being in first class and then coming back and being in coach class that was quite miserable, right? Now, the Apostle Paul said, I know how to be well-fed. I know how to eat filet mignon and wild salmon. And he says, I've also been hungry. He said, I know what it's like to have a lot, and I know what it's like to have a little bit. But regardless of all that, I, I can be content in all things. I have learned to be content in all things. That is what God's desire is for all of us today, is that we would not need the props, that we would not need the stuff of life to make us feel that sense of contentment. If we have blessings, if we're riding in first class, then awesome, then great. But you know what? There's sometimes in life when you're riding in the coach class, and God wants us to learn to be content with that as well. So it's not about our circumstances. It's not about uh, this or that. It's about learning to be content. And, and God wants us to learn that. Now, learning to be content doesn't mean that we always enjoy the journey. I'm sure that Paul from a, a Roman prison, was not in a great environment. I, I'm sure he didn't wake up in the morning and go, man, I love being chained to this soldier. You know, this is great. That's not what learning to be content is all about. Obviously, there's, there's situations in life that are difficult and challenging. But listen, your world can be crumbling around you, and you can still have the contentment of God. You can still have the peace of Christ ruling in your heart, even when you lose your job. And even when you're not able to pay your bills, and even when you have great uncertainties about the future, God can do something in your heart that brings that sense of stability, that sense of consistency. Uh, being being uh, content does not mean that we are lazy, you know, that we're indifferent. But it means that we have that steady awareness of the presence of God in our lives. And I believe this is what God is doing in our church. Several weeks ago, I announced that we, we had not moved into our new building as anticipated because the, the other party had not completed some things in the contract that we signed in June. And uh, we've done everything that we've been required to do in the contract to get ready to move into this building. Unfortunately, the other party has not, and it has delayed our move in. And, and that's a little frustrating. We're all a little frustrated by that. But we can still learn to be content with where we are. We had five people commit their lives to Jesus Christ just last week in our services right here, right? 
And so God is still working here. We got one eye on the future. We know God is leading and directing us. We're hoping to move in in the near future. But, but at the same time, we're thankful for where we are today. And that doesn't mean that we slow down any of the ministry or any of the opportunities or any of the things that God would lead us to do or, or, or the lives that need to be changed uh, right here in this room this morning or the things that we'll do in the upcoming weeks. All that is all the same. We're still rocking on. We're still worshiping Jesus. We're still teaching the Bible. Lives are still being impacted. We're still doing all that because we're, we're content whether we have the Taj Mahal, which is what our new building is. It is the Taj Mahal or whether we have Liberty Middle School, it doesn't matter. We can be content in all things, but that's something that has to be learned. You know, we need to teach this to our kids. They say that America has 4% of the, of the world's children, 4% in our country, but we consume 40% of the toys bought in the world. Our kids got lots and lots of stuff, don't they? My kids are small. They're four and six. They've just kind of discovered that there are kids that have a lot of stuff that they don't have, you know, and they've been kind of hanging out with the tweeners. You guys know what tweeners are? Like 10 to 12-year-olds, like wannabe teenagers, you know, and uh, my little boy, he's six. He said, Dad, I need an iPod, and I said, well, son, what are you going to do with the iPod? He said, well, I need to ride my new skateboard. And I need to listen to my iPod. And by the way, I've already got Superman headphones. So all I need is the iPod and the skateboard. And I said, well, why, did, you know, why do you need that? And he's like, well, I saw this teenager. You know, that's what he was doing. And uh, my kids have told me recently that they need a Kindle Fire, a Wii, two new bikes, a skateboard, a cell phone, and an iPod. Wow. <laughs> all at once. <laughs> Dad, these are necessities, you know. And I'm like, oh, man, maybe we need to hang out with little kids. I'm not sure. I still love the PlayStation 2. You know, I'm like, what is wrong with PlayStation 2? Why do we need a Wii? Anyway, you know, every parent wants to give all their kids all those things. We'd love to do that. But you know what? It's also good to tell our kids no sometimes and to teach our kids to be content with having a little as much as we want to give them all these things. Because if we give our kids every single thing that they want, then they'll never learn what it is to, to experience the secret of contentment that comes through the power of Jesus Christ in our lives. And that's what's most important, isn't it? It's not about all this stuff. So the first thing is we have to learn to be content. It's a process. It takes some time. It takes some energy. Here's the second thing. My level of contentment has nothing to do with my situation. Did you know that? It is independent of my circumstances, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And oh my goodness, you need to underline that phrase. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Regardless of the state I'm in, I've learned to be content. Here's a great word for us. God wants to change our heart and we're asking God to change our circumstances. God wants to change you. See, so many times we're looking around saying, God, would you change my scenario? Would you change this? God says, I want to change you. I want to change your heart. And we believe that everything is situational. If this one thing would just change, if my relationship uh, relationships would just change, then I would feel a sense of contentment. If, if I just had this 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 new job, then I would feel a sense of contentment. If my house was just a little bit bigger, if I could just get a car that was a little bit nicer, if I could just, if I could just have this, if I could just do that, then, the, the, then I would feel that sense of contentment. But Paul says contentment is, is not based on circumstances. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances and I know what it is to have plenty, and, and I know what it is to have very little. So it's not about the stuff. It's not about the circumstances. And you know, when we begin to live a life that is beyond our circumstances, we begin to experience the contentment of God in our lives. We will live a life that demands an explanation by people who do not know Jesus Christ. People will say to you, how are you content, man? 
you're struggling financially. You're struggling in this area, and you're not freaking out. You're not worried. You're not anxious about tomorrow. You have this, this peace and this consistency in your life. What is that? And that's one of the greatest honors, one of the greatest privileges of a follower of Jesus. That people would look at our life, and they would say, man, you have something that I do not, and I need to know what that is. We live lives that demand those explanations. And we, see, we experience the same struggle from two different extremes. When you have a little, you want more. And when you have a lot, you want more. When you don't have money, you want more. When you have money, you want more. You know, when you have money, you worry about trying to keep it. When you don't have money, you worry about trying to get it. We worry all the time about our finances. God says, be content with, with what's going on in your life regardless of of, what, or of where you've been or, 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 or what, what you may think that you need. And if money alone would solve all of our problems, then, then you know that many of the lottery winners would have experienced a far different outcome than what they've experienced. In fact, they say uh, that only 50% of lottery winners say that their life is happier three years later. Now, some of us have just thought to ourselves, I'd like to try that out. You know, I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to be surveyed on that. But listen to this. In 2011, there was a, a girl named Amanda Clayton. She was a young mom, and she won the Michigan lottery. She won a million bucks. And she, she was really famous because she was collecting food stamps while she was a millionaire. You know, maybe you heard about that on the news. But, you know, only a short time after her, her winning the million dollars in Michigan, she OD'd on a drug. Uh, she overd overdosed on a, a drug addiction. And, and she took her own life, man. She just had a million dollars. Wow. Uh, there's a guy named Billy Bob Harrell who won $37 million in the Texas jackpot. And uh, he ended his own life less than two years later when he realized that all that he wanted was his marriage back. But he had gone on an out-of-control spending frenzy and drove his wife crazy. And Instead of bringing the marriage together, instead of blessing the family, it became a huge wedge and they... They ended in divorce, and he took his own life a couple of years later. Here's my, here's my, I think, the most interesting story. Juan Rodriguez, he, he won $149 million in the New York lottery. $149 million, that is a lot of money. His wife had just thrown him out two weeks before. Now, all of a sudden, $149 million. Amazingly, they were reconciled. <laughs> Can you believe that? If your ex-spouse wins $149 million, you may want to pray about that, okay? So they get back together. She claims half of the earnings and then splits. They, they get a divorce. You would think that $149 million, you could hire enough therapists, counselors, medication, vacation homes, boats, airplanes, whatever else in life that you may need to feel content to fix whatever problems are there in the family, but in the end, that wasn't the problem to start with. You see, what we need is not more stuff and, and not just a change of circumstances. What we need is God to do something in our heart. Now, does this mean that we're lazy? Of course not. Does this mean that we don't have goals? Of course not. Does this mean that we enjoy the hardships that we're going through? No, of course not. But it does mean that we can begin to experience contentment outside of our own problems that we're facing. We don't need the outside props of the world to make us feel good. You see, if we need outside stuff to make us feel a sense of contentment, we, we really don't understand who Jesus Christ is and what he wants to do in our lives. Now you may think, well, Ryan, that sounds cool, but... If you knew the problems I had, you'd be discontent. Let me remind you a little bit about the Apostle Paul's story. Okay, this is what he went through. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was shipwrecked, jailed, stoned, that is, with rocks. He was, yeah, you can laugh. Uh, he was, he was uh, without food, without friends, without money, and periodically without freedom. Left for dead, beat up. When Paul's talking about the secret of contentment, we're not talking about some naive guy that had 
the life given to him on a silver platter. We're talking about someone who had been through some of the most heartbreaking, stressful, difficult experiences in life. And the question is, well, well what was it that, that allowed the apostle to say with such confidence, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances? Watch this. Here's the, here it is. My contentment comes from a relationship with Jesus. This is really the answer. This is where this whole thing comes together. My contentment comes from a relationship with Jesus. See, it, it doesn't come from a self-help book. It doesn't come from an article, Five Easy Steps to, to Be More Content. Most of us in this room would rather do something because it, 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 it gives us that satisfaction of checking off the boxes. We would rather do something rather than focus on knowing Christ. But if you want to experience contentment in life, it's all about knowing Christ. It's all about knowing Him. In, ch in chapter 3, verse 10, the apostle said this, I want to know Christ, and yes, the power of his resurrection. So in chapter 3, it's about knowing Christ. Then in Philippians 4, 13, he says, For I can do everything God asked me to do with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and the power. So we see there is a knowing Christ, and then there is a sense of contentment. I can do all things. When you're focused on knowing Christ, you're not focused on having the corner office or where your name is printed or what's going on in life. You're focused on knowing Him. So if we could begin to change our focus from, from all of the stuff to knowing Him, the result of that will bring, bring about a great sense of contentment. So here's the thing. God is the only thing that is consistent in the universe. Do you know that? You can't control the stock market. You could not control the economy. You could not control interest rates. You could not control your boss. You could not control so many other things. You have absolutely no control over those things. If, if those things have to be in perfect order for you to have a sense of contentment, I'm afraid you're always going to be frustrated. But what the apostles challenging us in this morning is to, to see beyond that and to realize that the, the contentment that we so much desire comes through knowing Christ. It's being connected to Him. It's knowing the Lord. And that's why he says in Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. I, I love the Living Bible. It says uh, uh, this, this paraphrase, for I can do everything God asks me to with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. Whatever God calls you to do, He's going to give you the strength to do it. A lot of the things that we're doing in life are not things God has called us to do. And we wonder, why am I so discontent? Why am I so frustrated? What if we begin to realign our priorities and begin to try to figure out what God wanted us to do rather than doing what we want to do and then pray for God to bless it? It's a big difference. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. This really is prob probably the most famous verse in the Bible outside of John 3.16. You see it at the football game sometimes, or you see it in, quoted in different places, Philippians 4.13. It's a great verse. Uh, every time I read this verse, I think about my own experience as a high school football player. Uh, I went to a Christian school, and we had sweatbands that had Philippians 4.13 on them. We would wear them, you know, to our games. And I thought, man, this is awesome. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That means we're going to win the state championship this year, you know. And I was so excited about these sweatbands, you know. I was like rubbing my legs with them, you know, rubbing my head and all this. We're ready to go. I, I really wanted to go over and rub my quarterback's hands with them because he was throwing so many interceptions, you know. And I was like, and I really wish you would get me the ball. Here, let me, let me you know, rub Philippians 4.13 a little bit on you there. No kidding, the very first varsity football game that we had, we lost 73 to nothing. <laughs> that is beyond humiliating. 73, the other team had over 500 yards rushing against us. It was, it was pathetic. They had a running back, and you, you can't appreciate the story if you don't know this, but the running back for the other team was a guy named Greg Hill that went on to become an All-American running back at Texas A&M. And then he played in the NFL for a bunch of teams. He was a really good football player, by the way. It was really hard to tackle him. <laughs> Wasn't good. 
And I was thinking 73 to nothing and Philippians 4.13, how does this work together? You know, God, come on, you know. And, and I realized that what Philippians 4.13 is about, it, it's, it's, it's in the context of something far different from what we normally pull that verse out of. A lot of times we just quote Philippians 4.13 and we, we take that to mean that if I can think it, then I can achieve it. Uh, if I tell myself this enough times, then whatever I think should happen will happen. It's all in the context of contentment. Verses 11 and 12, Paul's saying, I've learned to be content in all things. So Philippians 4.13 is saying, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, but it's tied to being content. It's not tied to just whatever we think that we may need or whatever we may want. It's a big difference. But listen, you can be content regardless of what is going on in your life. And I believe that is one of the most powerful concepts. If we could just get our mind around that today, uh, it would greatly inspire us and give us so much hope for the future because our circumstances do not define our contentment. So whether we are winning or losing, whether we are in first class or coach class, God wants us to, to learn what it means to be content. And if God calls you to do something, he's going to give you the strength to accomplish it. If God has called you to be a parent, he's going to give you the patience and the strength to be a parent. And if God's called you to get a degree, he's going to give you the patience and the strength that you need to finish your coursework. So remember that. I can do all things through Christ who, who gives me the strength that I need. So how does God's power flow through me? If it really is all about my relationship with Jesus that brings this sense of contentment. Let me share a couple of great verses with you. The first is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. I love this scripture. My gracious favor is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may work through me. You see, when you're actually weak, that's when you're strong. When you feel vulnerable, when you feel uncertain, when you feel afraid, that's when you turn to the Lord. When you are weak, you are actually strong. People who think that they're strong and that they have life all figured out and they know all the solutions and answers, I don't need God, they're actually the people that are weak. You're going to become stronger by realizing that you're weaker. In our weakness, His strength is made perfect. 2 Peter 1.3 goes on and says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him. So you may think, I don't think it's possible to be content. Well, 2 Peter tells us God has given us everything we need to live a life of godliness. Everything that we need. So this is absolutely possible to overcome anxiety, to overcome worry in your life, to overcome that spirit of discontentment is an achievable goal if Jesus Christ is truly the focus of our life. Ephesians 3.20 goes on, it says, Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. It is the power of Jesus within us that is giving us the capability to say no to the aspirations of the world, and what everybody else says that we need in life to feel content and to begin to refocus us on the things of God and the things that His Word says to us. The power comes through knowing Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, many people go through their entire lives never experiencing that sense of contentment with God. Listen, God wants you to be able to say, whether you're sitting in first class, whether you're sitting in coach class, I'm content in all things. Whether it's 73 to nothing or whether it's 0 to 73, I'm content in all things because the focus of my life is knowing Christ is not just the stuff. Let's just bow together for a word of prayer.